And then visuals. Um, I talked earlier about this. Um, putting them on the wall, putting it on your website, letterhead. Constantly reminding yourself and others that we stand for this. We want to be that. This is what we do for you. And invariably, the more you say, the more it kind of occurs to you, either, we, either you're doing it or you're not. And it also allows other people to remind you what you said you'd do for them. Um, I think you team who said they'd give you a loan in 48 hours. So if I apply for a loan, I know how long I'm going to wait for my loan, right? 48 hours. And then I call them up and say, listen guys, you said 48 hours, what's happening? And that allows them, it's quite a kind of compelling proposition because it says, if after 48 hours, you haven't, we haven't given you the loan, you can give us an earful. And that also forces them to kind of um, get out of their seats and, and deliver. We'll take another step aside and talk about team building before we go back to the case study. Now, you've decided what your culture is. It's in the head of you, the promoter or the entrepreneur. You've probably got one or two people or you're thinking of making your first hires. Who do you bring on board? What kind of people do you get to join you to deliver? And we start off by accepting that your success is not, well, it's seldom going to come from the idea. It's unlikely that you're going to come up with this real kick-ass idea which nobody has ever thought about, and that's going to make you your millions. Because invariably somebody else has thought about it. No matter what you do, somebody else has thought about it. And even if they haven't, the minute you come up with it, they'll copy it. So the idea in itself is not going to save you. What's going to save you is your persistence and your relentless execution. Your mentality which says, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, even if there's competition, regardless of challenges, economic conditions, government policy, we will do this. That's what's going to help you. So you need a team that understands that. If you have a team that jumps out of the window at the first sign of um, adversity, you have a problem because it, you know, it's just you. You need a team that kind of fights with you. So we say that your startup team should have kind of a core team of promoters. Um, if there's one thing I've learned in terms of life as an entrepreneur, if you can call me that, well, one is that I should have started a lot earlier in life, like in my early 20s. And the other is that to the extent that you can, do it as a partnership. It, it definitely helps. Start young because obviously you, you have more time to make mistakes. You, know, you maybe make one or two serious mistakes and then you learn your lessons and move from there. But doing it as a team means you've got people to, to work with. Um, you kind of support each other, you encourage each other. And whenever there's a problem, it's a team sitting around the table with um, similar goals, hopefully a similar vision, and um, in the same boat. It is not the same as you going home to your mother to say, listen, I have a problem. Um, this guy in the office is really stressing me out. Your mom invariably will <laughs> take your side, and the advice she'll give you is usually the kind of best advice. Um, and even if it's good advice, you probably can't implement it because she doesn't know the context in which the problem is happening. But if there are two or three of you trying to build a business, then you can have a good professional conversation. Um, so to the extent that it makes sense, working as a partnership is good, I think. And then you need a strong board of directors. Um, and if you can, in addition to the directors, you have a board of advisors. And then staff who live the desired culture. So what we say about the core team, so this is the team within the team, right? You started your business. And what I'm saying is that if you can, find someone else who's trying to do the same thing you're trying to do and say, listen, we can either do this individually or we can come together and do this as a team. It's not always easy. It's, it can be very difficult. I always kind of liken it to marriage because you're going to be joined with this person. You're going to own the business together. It's shareholding. We're talking trust. We're talking sacrifice. We're talking you know, selfless um, sacrifice, you know, where you put other people's interest. It, it's, it's difficult, but it means you've, you've got more capacity, definitely more capacity than you trying to do it, do, do, do it yourself. 
And I'm saying that to the extent that you have that team, the team should have people who play this role. So first, you should have the dreamer, the person who dreams big. Um, because you usually have to set big goals for yourself. Don't kind of look to do just a little bit. See, say to yourself, listen, I'm really going to, if I'm going to build a car, I'm going to build a Rolls Royce. I'm not going to build some pokey little two by four car, right? If I'm going to build a house, I'm going to build a palace. The reason why you do that is, even if you don't build a palace, you build a very big mansion. Otherwise, you, you probably just build something very small. So you need a dreamer who keeps saying, listen, guys, this is too small, let's do something bigger. They don't know how it's going to be done, but they are, they are the guys who always say, let's do it bigger, let's do it better. You know, let's be Google, let's do this across other countries in Africa, we can do this in Europe. They, they come up with some crazy ideas, which sometimes forces you to think outside the box. And then you need a customer champion. The person who makes sure that you don't lose sight of where your money is coming from, because invariably you always need a, a customer. If you have a business, you don't have a customer, you don't have a business. So there must be someone who's customer focused. And again, it's not always obvious. You have people who are really passionate about the business, but they really don't care about the customer. People, there are people like that. So you need people who always say, but this is bad for the customer. Are we doing the best for the customer? You know, so somebody who constantly reminds you of that. And it's good if they are part of that, that core team because it shapes your business decisions. You, so you don't just think about the money. You say to yourself, what kind of product are we putting out there? Would our customers thank us for this? Is it the best value we can give them? And somebody needs to remind you of that. And then there's the innovator, the guy who is always thinking of a smarter way to do the same thing, a better way to do it, a cheaper way to do it, constantly saying, listen, can we do this any other way? Why are we doing it like this? Can, it, can we do it for nothing? Why are we even paying for it? You find these days a lot of things people pay for, which you can actually get for free. Um, and you need people constantly say, ah, this thing, you can see it on the net, it is free. Let's go find it. Let's, you know, so somebody who constantly does this. And then you need a rainmaker, the guy who um, finds the money, who makes the big deals happen. So you need different, you, you know, and the reason why doing it alone isn't always the best op option is because as an individual, you'll probably be one of these, at best you'll be two. It's unlikely you'd find four of these traits, which I hope you all agree are very necessary. It's unlikely you find all these four in one person. So if there are two of you, then you might find you have somebody who is very innovative and also likes, um, likes to dream. So they are innovative in their dreaming. And then you have someone who can make things happen and they, they, they're very good with numbers um, and, and thinks about the customer. So I would say at least find one more person if you want to build that kind of capacity. I mean, in our group, for instance, we are lucky because we have a whole chartered accountant sitting in our midst for free. So whenever it comes to heavy duty finance, we tend to Dominic and say, right, what does the IFRS say? It's kind of advice you usually have to go pay an accountant for. You know, so left to me, I can count. You know, I think I know a bit of finance, but I'm not an accountant. But if you have a partner who's an accountant, you get that kind of advice in real time for free. So that's what I'm saying that you know, these are kind of desirable traits which you might want to consider. So that's your core team, um, your promoters, the guys who are making the project lift off. And then your directors. Now when you go register a company, they'll ask you to name your directors. And what people tend to do is, because they are the sole shareholder, or probably they have one other shareholder, when it comes to directors, they put their sister, their mother, their two-year-old child, and some nephew who's like kindergarten. That can, they, they can't be directors. I mean, when you call a board meeting, I mean, it, it's just absurd. Wait, if you think of the word director, you're supposed to direct, right? They're supposed to give direction. Corporate governance, oversight. Tell you, listen, oh boy, it's your company, but let me tell you, you're screwing up. People who can say that to you straight into their eye. If they can't say that, they are not, uh, um, they are not good, good directors. Um, we had some really tough directors in the early days. We had, what we call the, what we call the board meeting. We had um, people coming out of South Africa. The chairman was South African, but he lived in Saudi Arabia. So we had, he used to come out of Saudi. We had guys coming out of SA, coming out of DC, coming out of Netherlands, coming out of Boston. So we had like United Nations sitting around the table. And, 
the day drillers. <laughs> um, it was tough. Very, I mean, we hated board meetings. Very stressful. But in the end, you say, you know, actually, the guys are right. They, they, they do have a point. We did miss something here. That's what directors do. They, they meet you four times a year and say, listen, you said you do this. You haven't done it. That's the kind of advice you need. People who know. So if you're going to, um, if, I don't know, if you have a restaurant business and you want directors, speak to people who know food, who know customer service, who understand catering. Um, or at least who like to eat outside, so they can tell you, listen, this is your restaurant, your service sucks, your menu is upside down. They can tell you because they live in restaurants. Um, don't go pick someone who never eats out. As a director, they're useless to you. You need directors for that reason. But most people who know the obligations of a director might turn down the invitation if approached by a small startup because they know you can't pay them and they see just downside risk, right? They're going to sign up as a director for some company. You might take a loan. The bank might ask directors to give their consent or even guarantee. And if the loan goes bad, they see their name in the papers, right? Such and such finance house suing XYZ company and all its directors. And they see their name there, not good. So some people might say, sorry, sweetheart, but I cannot be a director, I'm too busy. It's not because they are busy, it's because they know the cost benefit doesn't quite balance. So there's, no, there's not much by way of benefit, it's all cost. And that's the reason why you might struggle to find directors. But really, my advice is really kind of find people who, when you have them around the table, they can tell you things about your business which you need to hear, and only they can tell you. They shouldn't be afraid of you. They shouldn't be doing it because they're going to pay them some 500 cities. They should be able to tell you straight, listen, I think this is rubbish. If you like, fire me. I'd rather work than to be part of a company that is doing this. That's the kind of directors you need. You know, they tell it to you straight. Now, because you can't find, you can't always find good directors, um, not because they don't exist, but because they don't want their name on your company documentation. What some companies also do is, they have some directors, but then they also have some kind of advisory team. So advisory team is more informal. So there are people you kind of get around, give some you know, beer and kebab and say, right, tell us, what do you think? <laughs> what, what's happening in the market? Um, so if you had a real estate company and you, you had me on your advisory team, I'll tell you, listen, this is your house you're building. I think it's rubbish. If you want to see a good house, go to this other place. I was there last week. I think that's, what, that's where the action is. So you get free advice. Um, or you can pay for it if you wish. But people are more likely to do this than the, the form for, for legal reasons. Um, but either way, you need advice. And you need it from people who can give it to you straight. None of this kind of double speak. Um, because in the early days, you, you're doing so many different things. And you don't have the resources to hire people in-house to do the thinking for you. And sometimes, even when you hire them, everybody knows they might be in the office at their desk behind their PC, but they're not doing your business. Too. They are ordering their things from online from London to sell in their boutique somewhere, right? They're doing their own side business. So they're not working for you. You are paying them, but they're in their office doing their own thing. So you need people who once or twice you can call and get them to kind of give you good advice and give you um, good direction. And also tell you what they hear in the market about you. And then your employees. So I've spoken about the core team, the promoters. I've spoken about the board of directors. I've spoken about the advisory team. And then your core employees, I mean, the people who start the business. Because they normally tend to set, set the trend. It's just like your, your first born, right? If they are rebellious, you know all the other kids are going to follow. So you want to make sure that the first set of employees are kind of um, the type you'd like to, to have more of. And to the extent that everybody else who comes learns from them and you know, they are the people who do the orientation and tell people, listen, don't wear short skirts, don't do this, don't do that. Then they kind of, they do your work for you. Um, and you reward them and make sure they kind of become custodians of, 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 of the business because invariably you cannot run the business alone. They, they are the nucleus, they, they form the, the core of the operations of the business. Whilst you're out looking for loans and looking for new customers, they are making sure that the employee body stays together. So if, if you think of your starting team, um, that's 
not kind of the gospel according to me. So how has it worked for us, Ghana Home Loans, as a company? Now, we have <laughs> struggled with culture. Um, <coughs> if I had to describe our culture, is I'll describe it as informal but professional. And it's informal because I think in the beginning it was kind of um, the three of us and and I think one employee. We started when we started day one with four people, and we've all kind of done the formal stuff. So to us, this was like chill out time. So we came to work without ties, and gradually everybody came to work without ties because we weren't wearing ties. Um, we addressed everybody on first name basis. So. Um, the driver can come and say, hey, could you, your door is open or something, you know, so we have that kind of situation going on. Um, which is fine, I mean, we don't do the whole Mr. This, Mr. That very well. Um, we have an open door policy. Um, so, and we, we really mean it, I mean, the door is always open, um, and you can literally you can walk into any of our offices and say, listen, I think this thing should be changed, or I think this isn't working very well, or I think we should do this for our customers. And anybody, even the national service person who joined yesterday, can do that if they believe they can. I don't know if we say they can, but some people kind of don't do it. It's a self-imposed limitation. But it's there. I mean, the door is open. You can come. No problem. Um, sorry. So, so we have those who understand open door policy and use it, and others who don't understand and don't use it. But we do have an open door policy. And initiative is encouraged. So the two go together. We have an open door policy which says you can come and tell us, well, we think our cars are boring, let's change the design. And my response would be, why? And you say maybe, well, let's paint them funky, yellow, green. Okay, fine. You go do the design, show it around, get consensus, and do it. Now that's when people kind of freeze. Because we're thinking when they said, let's change it, it's going to be someone else's job. When you say something should be changed, it's okay, right, fine. Go, go do it. It's your call. Do it. And literally, that's what happens. So if you come up with some idea and it works, we give you initiative. No, go. It's your idea. Do it. And so people take ownership for um, ideas they come up with, which means some people never suggest anything because they know, <laughs> they, they know they'll, they'll be asked to do it. Um, Dressing, I talked about that earlier. I mean, um, it got to a stage where it was getting a bit crazy, so we came up with dress policy. So something that was done with great reluctance because we really wanted to keep it professional, informal. And that's because um, we already have a bit of an image problem. Um, people think because of where our office is located and the kind of things we do, we are there for the elite. Is there anybody who thinks that in this room? Mm -hmm. Initially, I thought. Yes. And that's the image we, we, we everybody says that they're there for the elite and we're there for the rich. And we say to them, listen, the rich don't borrow. I mean, the rich have their own houses. Um, the people, um, for well, the super rich don't borrow. Um, <laughs> and excuse me, I think um, you were one of the first people to introduce mortgages, and if people knew about mortgage, they felt, I mean, you should have something collateral yeah. to come for a mortgage. So, of course, you might think it's the elite. The elite. Right. Well, if I sell grants by the roadside, I'm the company thing. To come. Yeah, that's the bit we've, we've that's the image we've, that's exactly it. People think when you come to us, it means you already have your house. And we are saying, no, you come to us because you don't have the house. You know, so that's a bit of a contradiction. But yes, I mean, um, we, we have that image. And so people think of us and they think of the live view and they listen to the, the journalists going on the radio about some half million dollar house. And they think those are the people we're dealing with. It's not. We, we, we don't like dealing with it. We tend to operate at a much lower level. Um, and you come to us because you don't have the house. If, if you have a house, well, you can come to us with a house. We talked about that earlier when we talked about our products, when you need to do the home equity release mortgage. But otherwise, when you come to us, it means you are now looking to buy a house. So, so we are there for the, the homeless and people looking to buy homes. Um, but people, as I said, they, they hear about what we do and they say, yeah, posh, essentially, oh, okay, then that must be very posh. So we made it a point that we'll be as informal as possible. So none of this kind of shoes and kind of talking heels and all of those things. Um, but then staff started taking it to the next level and some of the dressing um, was getting a bit too much so we had to crack down and kind of formalize it. Um, otherwise it was very informal. Promotion and performance measurement. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, we like to think that it's all very merit-based. Um, you know, so at the end of the year, it's strict performance. You set targets, you hit them, you get promoted. You don't, that's the end of story. We don't get into you know, who, who knows this person and who knows that person. And um, I've mentioned about responsibility. So if somebody comes up with an idea, or if it's decided that somebody should do something, it doesn't matter who they are. It could be literally a national service person who joined last week. The authority is given to them. This is the person who does that. Um, it works for us as a management team. It doesn't always work in the middle ranks because in as much as we don't really care much about hierarchy, it seems to matter a lot in the middle ranks. So when you give that instruction to the junior um, national service person or the office junior, we actually have office juniors. Office juniors are people who just came out of SS and they spend a year with us before going off to university. So sometimes you get some very good ones and we say to them, listen, your job is to do this <coughs> wisely. And once you is given the authority to do it. And then they have to go see some kind of middle manager type and tell them, this is my job. You know, I'm supposed to tell you to do this. And people don't take that very well. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. It's, we're kind of struggling with the culture. We, it's like in progress. And we'll talk about what I, what, what I mean by that in a minute. So that gives you some kind of flavor of the environment we're creating. And I'll tell you why that's where we find ourselves today. Um, and that, I, I've spoken about this. You know, day one, it was just like three and a half people. And then by end of year one, we had been around for a year, and we're still under 15. I was trying to remember the number. We couldn't have been more than 10. Because I remember December 2006, for our office party, we managed to take the entire company to um, uh, Captain Cook, some nice restaurant in Katamis. And we all literally sat around the table. That's how small the company was. Driver, receptionist, everybody. So it was still like a very kind of small family. Um, and with the passage of time, you have national service people joining year after year, six people, seven people. Um, and so it's never quite come out of that mold. And this goes back to what I was talking earlier about you growing without noticing your growing. So we've never really been able to take a big leap to say we are no longer small, we are now big. Um, we've always found ourselves in that. We like that zone. It's nice. It makes people feel at home. So we kind of find ourselves stuck there. Um, and so we've kind of added waves of young, fresh graduates. And because they really don't come to us with much by way of previous experience, they haven't been able to change the culture either because, quite frankly, they have nothing to, to change it with. Some mid-level hires might make the odd change here or there, but the majority are, are just fresh. Um, and um, the other point to this is uh, meritocracy. In other words, we, we tend not to hire people because we, we know them. Um, we are looking at this last time and we realized we had hired over, I don't know, 70 or, no, we actually had about 100 people since we started. And none of them were known to us before, we, before they joined the company. Now when you think about that, that's quite unusual because we know a lot of people, you better believe that. We, we know you know, friends, family, people we could have brought in. But we never, we've never really hired anybody because there are some mates, cousin, or some friend we know from somewhere. Everybody we've hired has been because we looked at them together and thought, this person, they're good. You know, they're good at school. They have a good personality. And so they, we've hired just good people, and they've joined a good team, and everybody's just kind of blended together. But we haven't really succeeded, this is me confessing, in, in kind of putting a very firm structure on it. And that's because of the way we've evolved and, and the kind of people we've brought in year after year. And along the way, besides the fact that we brought young people just on the basis of merit, um, our culture, as it is, has also been shaped by uh, um, well, founding shareholders and the directors. The early set of directors we had were very um, frugal. So we always used to fight over expenditure. You know, costs are too high, cut, cut back on costs. So a lot of things which would have been used to kind of build in the early days, we decided not to, not to touch. Um, I've talked about the size of the organization. The need to hit performance targets. Um, we, we're a very performance-driven organization. So what that means is there comes a time of year when nothing else matters except targets. 
So um, everything just goes out of the window. Oh, values. It's just we have to hit the targets. And that has impacted culture because you have what we found is that, um, for instance, last year, last year was our best year. We did about $25 million in disbursements. But last year, we said to everybody, listen, this year your performance will be 70% based on targets. It was good in the sense that for the first time in the company, everybody was talking to everybody because everybody was looking at that one number. We had to hit 25 million. It was like a relay. Somebody picks up a file, does what they have to do, fix it, somebody, you know, because everybody's working together. This year, we changed the targets and immediately we had silo mentality. Pick up a file, I do my bit. It's now your responsibility. If you have a problem, don't come back to me. Um, and so we've realized the impact Target has on, on, um, on, um, on the culture. And so we are now coming up with a new system which blends targets and values. Because what we found last year was that, yes, the target was go, 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 go. It brought everybody together. It was really good for team building. It didn't do too well on our other measures, which is um, customer service. Um, Sometimes accuracy, completeness. We have other softer targets we chase. The whole machinery was focused on delivering those targets. And we kind of dropped some balls along the way. So our new challenge is to find a way of setting performance targets so that you get that good part of the culture without um, losing out on other aspects of the business. I've spoken about our vision and mission statements. That has shaped our culture. Capacity. Um, the fact that for two, three years in our early lives, we didn't have an HR manager. In fact, actually more than that, five years? Six? No, no, about five years. Um, 06 to 11. Um, we had somebody coming temporarily, but really got the first HR manager after five years. Now think about this. This is a financial institution, major recruitment campaigns from time to time, all kinds of HR issues. But we had such a tight rain on expenses that several positions were not filled, and HR was one of them. So um, if somebody had to speak to HR, they were speaking to me, and I don't have any training in HR whatsoever. Um, and so that also created some element of the culture. It was very kind of free spirit, um, because I'm a bit laid back like that. You know, as long as you're, you're hitting your targets, if you want to take leave, you don't have to come to me three days before, just come the night before. I say, okay, good, just make sure you're back on time. So it created a certain kind of free spirit culture. People would just come and go and, the staff loved it, but that doesn't build the kind of organizational discipline and culture you need. Um, but now we fix that. We have an HR person. And then the staff profile. Um, I spoke about that earlier, the fact that we had young people coming in fresh out of school. That meant, uh, as an organization, it was always you know, people had just joined, some people had just left, and we went through ways where people just stay with us for six months, go off to do their masters. So we had a very transient young workforce. So we didn't really have a core group of people kind of building that steady culture. And so as I said, we've, we've had them, it, it remains work in progress and we definitely have had our shell by challenges. Um, rewarding characteristics we wish to encourage. We haven't been able to always do that. So we know something is really good. We wish everybody would do it. But for a host of reasons, um, we haven't been able to always reward but more importantly, we haven't also been able to always punish deviance. And that's because when you are that size, when you're like 20, 30 people, you get very kind of chummy, chummy. Everybody knows everybody. And okay, so it was a bit rude to the customer. Hey, don't do that again. That's the end of the story. You don't really write query letters and you know, have panels, and, which is possible in a much larger organization because it's less personal. Um, so that's something we are aspiring to. That's where we find ourselves, you know, coming up with a slightly more rigid organization. I've talked about the absence of layers of hierarchy. It's a very flat organization, and we, um, and we, we like that. But it's not always appreciated. Some people would rather have layers so that as time goes on, they know they are progressing, especially when you're in the middle. Um, and as such, it's not always easy to build team spirit for the reasons I listed earlier. And you also find that because it's a small organization and because we haven't really been able to put knowledge transfer structures in place, somebody comes, that's a very important assignment because they just kind of 
six people in the unit, and they worked on it, and they were leaving in a year. They didn't share that knowledge. So before you know it, a very important assignment has been done, concluded. The person is gone, and nobody seems to know what they did. The files are there, but you didn't really have like a group of people whose job it is to debrief the person and capture it and use it to train other people, which is the kind of thing you can do in a 200-person organization. Um, and the other challenge we've had is because most of our staff are fresh out of school, they really don't have a sense of comparison. You know, when you've worked in three or four places, when you get to work somewhere else, you can say, ah, okay, it's not bad. You know, um, it's, it's good in this respect and bad in that respect. But when you have no other basis for comparison, um, Everything is like the end of the world. Oh my God, my boss said this. You know, the world has come to an end. Um, I'm so upset. Or this happened and what does it mean? It's difficult to, um, to manage expectations of staff and that shows up in other, in other aspects of, of behavior. So if I had to mark ourselves, I would say we're probably five out of 10. If you're looking for strong culture, um, it is not us. We are working at it. God knows we're working at it. Um, but we are not there yet. But we recognize what the issues are, and we, we think we have an idea how to fix them. Um, and I'm sure if most organizations were being honest with themselves, they'd probably say the same thing. So why does any of this matter? Why am I standing there talking plenty? Why, why, is it, why, are, we, why are we here? And that's because culture, your team, your business, how they relate to each other, how the company relates to staff, how things are done, invariably will affect how your clients are treated. You know? we, we see this in our business. If you have a staff who is kind of a bit prickly and always has issues with other staff, if you observe very closely, you realize they have that same attitude with clients. It might not be obvious to start with, but if you really observe, you realize, and, and that's what's gonna kill your business. Um, I have this theory that in Ghana, it's not competition that kills your business. It's not imports from China that will kill your business. No, no, it's not government tax. You, you can survive all of that. In fact, competition is the last thing to kill your business because um, you find the bigger your competitors, the easier they are to beat, right? Um, and what they also do is they tend to provide you with what in business is called the price umbrella. And do you know, does anybody know what the price umbrella is? Okay, price umbrella is where, let's say, I wanted to create a, an airline that flies London at crap. I've got good old BA there. They said the, the fare is this high. Um, so I, I can hide under that price. You know, I can, you know, B is charging 1,005, I'll charge 1,499 or something. You know, I don't need to charge that, but I can. Um, and if, if they are smart enough, they'll recognize the game I'm playing. And so they won't drop it to 1,004 and we kind of live next to each other. They get a lot of the business, I get. So your competitor, there are places where competition can kill you. You know, BA will drop its prices to 700, kill you, and then go back up. And, but here, invariably, if your business is going to suffer, it's because your employees are going to do that. They are the ones who will pick up the phone. They are the ones who will be rude to your customers. They are the ones who probably try to sell your diesel or something. So you need to get that cult, you know, the bad use, your, the, you know, it's very important to know how your clients are being treated, how your assets are being treated. Um, your culture also determines how your company fights the competition. Because there is competition, I'm not saying there isn't, there is. But your values, your, um, how you position the business, the customer experience, um, your financial performance, your innovation, all of that comes through culture. You know, we spoke earlier about how our meetings organized. Does everybody have the, the right to speak? Is everybody heard? Are ideas freely exchanged? Or do the big people at the front turn around and say to them, yeah, no, yeah, small boy, what do you know? You know, there are big places where you can't speak if you just came. You have to wait until you've been around for like three, four years before you can open your mouth. You might have something sensible to say. Nobody wants to hear it. They'll say, wait. When you've been around for three years, then you can speak. And so those are things which can affect how your company fights competition. Innovation, same thing. I mean, somebody's come out of school. We had a presentation yesterday. The Bank of Ghana guys were around. And um, halfway through, we realized some national service person we had recently had actually done some rather amazing work in anti-money laundering. Even we didn't know that, right? Um, but now we know. We kind of intend to use their skills to do other things. 
So sometimes the new person who's just joined can help your innovation and, and drive, uh, help drive your business. So it's the culture you, you create that will let these things emerge and then you can use it as a resource to propel your business. If your culture stifles that, then um, you don't get the advantage you look for. Um, the culture also allows you to bounce back in difficult moments. The culture says, we aspire to be the biggest and best company that does this in Ghana. So even in those kind of really horrible moments where things are looking very bleak, you look at the, your values in the world and say, listen guys, this is what we are trying to do. Let's bring out the best in us because we said we're going to do this. We have to do it. You know, it keeps you focused um, and it all, you know, everything comes together. Your values, your mission, everything we've spoken about. And that's what pulls you through because you know you're working towards something. You know everybody in the room has a role to play. You know everybody's being heard with respect. Um, and you know everybody has something to contribute. So everybody's allowed to kind of play their part. And, and, and you come up with solutions to, to difficult moments. And that essentially determines whether your company will kind of simply survive or to really kind of do major things. And that's why culture is important. And that's why um, well, we spoke about using culture to select your team. But using culture to build a team is important because of these reasons. And um, I hope I've made that case very well tonight. Thank you very much. Now, now question time. I'm asking them. Okay, let's have your questions first, and I'll ask my, I'll ask my questions. Yes, please. How did the de-dollarization affect the mortgage industry? Ooh, that's a big one. Um, well, it's not just the de-dollarization. Um, the de-dollarization has been around for quite a while. Okay, so I didn't really get into our products, but maybe I should explain this. Um, we, we took the decision back in the early days to do dollar mortgages. Um, and it's for a very simple reason. If, if we had time, that's the topic of another presentation, but we could demonstrate to you that given where CD interest rates are, okay, let me take a step back. If you came to us, we could either give you a CD facility or give you a dollar facility. We are indifferent. Whatever you want, we'll give it to you. But for most people, the CD interest rates are such that they don't qualify. They're too high. And now they've even gone higher. So back in 06, the rates were, I think, about 17, 18% in CDs. With hindsight, <laughs> we're much lower than. What you're saying is if you were to go to um, Bank of Ghana and say, I want a loan for my property, it's a 17 and a half interest. No. When I, when, okay, when I say rates, I'm talking about treasury bill rates. Okay. That's the benchmark rate. So I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. So when you come to us, we, we have to either give you CDs or dollars. Now, the way it works is if you want a CD loan, we take the treasury bill rate and we have to add a margin. And the reason why we have to add a margin to the treasury bill rate is we borrow to lend the money to you. And the people we, you know, we don't borrow from governments. We borrow from other institutions. Now those institutions can either lend to the government or they can lend to other corporates in the market. So they have no special reason to lend to us. Again, they're not lending for three months or six months or nine months. They're lending for 10 years, 15 years. That's long term. So it's very expensive. So they use the treasury bill rate as the benchmark. So they use T-bill at the margin. We have to add a margin to their margin. So it's treasury bill plus plus. That's how you come up with your CD rate. So when you come to us, we, we can either give you that CD rate, the treasury bill plus plus, or we can give you the dollar rate. The dollar rate too is established the same way. Um, we borrow from institutions that would have raised money from other places. And they use other benchmarks. They use LIBOR, they use the 15-year government, US government. This is dollar borrowing. So they would have gone to borrow money using that benchmark. And so the net effect is that you come to us, or if you came to us in 2006, the treasury bill rate was about 17%. So we would have been lending at about 25, 26%. The, the dollar rates there were about 12% back in 2006. And it's been, you know, that gap has kind of stayed right through. So we looked at the numbers and decided for most people, it makes sense to lend in dollars. Those who want CDs take CDs. But when, when we show you the numbers, 
it's very clear, night and day, you will take the dollar. And you will take the dollar because even though you earn cities, the monthly amount you pay in cities, the city equivalent of the dollar amount you have to pay us is about half the city amount you have to pay us. So if two people came to us, bought the same house, took the same loan, the person who took the city loan is paying about 3,000 cities for a particular house type. The other person who took a dollar loan is paying about 1,500 in cities for the dollar amount. They both have a problem. The city person has a problem because they are paying too much now. And if the city rates moved higher, they'll pay more. Rates move lower, they'll pay less. Right? So that's the problem they have. It's an interest rate risk. The dollar guy has a, a problem. If the exchange rate moves, they pay more. Otherwise, they pay the same. So that's how it was back in 06. So everybody who came, showed them cities, showed them dollars, they took dollars. So that's how it was. And then, and so that's how we built 100 million plus worth of loans, right? And we ended up with a portfolio exclusively in dollars. So we had this issue where Central Bank came out and said, you cannot lend in dollars. You cannot take dollar deposits. You can't do this, you can't do that. Um, for us, what that meant was, but, but OK, but they were kind enough to say that if the loans have already been dispersed, they can keep running. So the existing portfolio, people just came. And what it meant was um, those who used to give us dollar checks couldn't issue dollar checks anymore. That was a huge disruption to our business because the way it works is you give us 12 checks every year and every month we take one to the bank. So all those checks which people had given us had to be recalled and they had to give us city checks. Right? Um, and then people had to figure out how much in cities they were going to give us every month, which when you think about it is a moving number because every month the city equivalent will change. Um, and we also had this bizarre thing where all the banks were putting different rates. So somebody, we tell somebody, okay, you owe us thousand dollars, can we have the city equivalent? They go to their bank, take out city, uh, city equivalent of a thousand dollars, come to us, we call our bank, and they're given a different rate. So the thousand dollars in cities now becomes like nine fifty dollars because of exchange rate. So it, it was all kinds of headaches like that. What it also meant was we couldn't write new business in dollars, so we had to write everything in cities. And I've just explained that cities is very expensive. So people would come, which well, we couldn't show them the dollars anymore. So we showed them the cities, and they didn't qualify. Um, it also meant that. The loans we had approved but hadn't dispersed, we had about $30 million of those. People who had come to us, we had approved everything, they were going to finish their documentation or wait for the developer to finish building the house, we couldn't disperse those. So it had all kinds of repercussions, very serious. So we went back to Bank of Ghana and said, listen, this is not working. Um, and I always say that they were very, 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 very accommodating. I mean, we had several meetings, we took it to the very top um, and explained to them and they immediately saw why when it comes to real estate, this dollar thing isn't like a luxury, it is essential. It's different from someone using dollars to buy butter or bacon or cheese or something. That's, you can live without cheese, right? But when it comes to real estate, it's, it's difficult. It, it, you, you can't work it in cities. And along the way somewhere, the rates went from, about the treasurable rate went from 22 to 26. So then our rates jumped to 36. So then that made it almost impossible, it was impossible. Um, so yeah, it almost kind of killed the business. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we went back to them and explained, and that and pressure from, I guess, everywhere else meant they had to have a rethink. And, um, and so yeah, so they, 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 they withdrew the policy. It comes back to moments of adversity, because we had to have a team around and say, guys, this is serious. I mean, we can't, if this goes on for one or two years, we have a problem. So we're now looking at alternative ways of doing business and um, it triggered a whole new way of thinking. And um, it actually had a very interesting um, output because now we're thinking of all kinds of different things. You know? oh, that was the next question. That. So lesson learned. Lesson learned is. Uh, do you say, just in case another government comes and it does the same thing because there's, yeah, it has confidence now. Yeah. Well, I think it's, Given the reaction, given the impact of that particular policy, I'll be very surprised if in our lifetime anybody tries that again. I mean, that was serious. People lost their properties, people lost their business. It was serious. 
and I, the city still hasn't recovered. Because when it happened, it was 2.2 to the dollar. It just went boom. And we, every day we had a different call from the bank, different exchange rate. So it, it, and it would have gone to four, we saw projections of five, six to the dollar. If anybody tries that again, I, don't, I, I wouldn't know what to say. Well, but can I challenge that? Yes, sir. Sure. In the sense that, this is just an observation. Yes. I think in Ghana, the people mm -hmm. who vote and determine who governs it, they're not likely to apply for a mortgage. You know, and it is seen that it is the posh people who get these mortgages and who suffer for it. Yeah. And long may they suffer. Yeah. So I really don't think that um, what you're saying is right. But it might happen again. Someone might may take the same decision as a populist yeah. decision. Um, and I feel yeah. if somebody will take that same decision, they will make sure other things are ticked right. I'm coming from London, I did a bit of mortgages and all that, and I think um, if, <laughs> I'm sorry, but if another party came on and they have worked abroad, they would realize that if certain boxes had been set right, they could go back to it again, say no de dollarization, it wouldn't affect the I'm just saying that the sort of people that are affected by governments taking these decisions, they, they have a complaint. Yeah, I, I think, I, let me just observe that what this particular policy, it, did, it wasn't just, it, it, had, it wasn't directed at the real estate sector, and the way it came out, it impacted everybody. Because, and even, I, I would even argue it impacted the government itself, because the exchange rate popped up in all kinds of transactions. It was a lot of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. They did it to stop a particular type of action. But then you realize everything you touch has a dollar element in it, and it gives people the right to jack up the prices. So the average person who thinks they don't even touch a dollar will find that all of a sudden, the food they're buying is more expensive. Obviously, fuel is more expensive for a different reason. But everything started moving up. So it, 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 it was so pervasive that that's why I'm saying if, if it had been a policy targeted at real estate, I'd agree. That's just a little microcosm. And even that one, um, there was another policy which came out which said they're going to impose VAT on real estate. And even that had to be backtracked because, you know, asset contribution to GDP is so fundamental. You really, really must know what you're doing before you start tinkering. Because it affects so many different people, you know, the little mason, the carpenter, the real estate developer, the, the, the multiplying effect. It's, it's, it's so pervasive that you must be very careful because once you, like, you know, a lot of the developers haven't recovered. The businesses just went boom. They laid off people. Um, and, and as I said, through our regular meetings, we were able to convince them that this is not, it's not a good policy. So yeah, I mean, lessons learned is always think the unthinkable. When you're doing your risk planning and somebody says, um, what's the worst thing that could happen? Like, really think what's the worst, worst thing that could happen because it could happen. Now we know, um, uh, it's funny because we were speaking to this guy in Ukraine um, late last year, and um, he was telling us that they went through something similar. Um, they had a huge situation. This is a bit, you know, this, he was talking about three, four years back. So they went through this whole currency crisis and the currency devalued, and their central bank forced them to change all their foreign currency loans into local currency. And so that's a lot more dramatic than what happened here. Here, loans in existence continue to travel. The new ones couldn't be done. So it's fine, your portfolio remains stable. If you had to change every loan into dollars, that would, into cities, that would be a real um, suicide mission. And we were listening to him thinking, I mean, this is crazy, that would never happen in Ghana. And then we kind of, we got ours. So we were speaking to him earlier this year when, <laughs> when he told us he had now moved to Poland because I don't, know if you, I don't know if you're following what's happening in Ukraine. The whole place has blown up, and that really kind of got us thinking. So what I mean is, you you must always think about the worst thing that could happen and plan for that scenario because invariably it does happen. So where will we move then? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what we've done. What, okay, for instance, we, 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 we embedded a scenario where, let's say the whole of Ghana disappears, right? We still have obligations. We still have lenders who are expecting to be paid, right? And so when we back up our data, we have an in-country backup, and then we back up to the US, 
So we have an offsite offshore, which, and it's simple things like that. It doesn't cost as much as it sounds. It just takes a bit of bandwidth. But you're sitting there saying, what would happen if, I don't know, the whole of Accra was washed, you know, big wave, everything washes, everything in Accra. It sounds impossible, but if you listen to the news, people have gone through that. What happens to your business? And that's the kind of scenario planning we now force ourselves to do. To say, what if? What was the craziest thing that could happen? A plane is flying overhead, an engine comes off, drops on your building. Could it happen? Yes, it can. Has it happened somewhere? Yes, it has. What happens? Where would your files be? So we then went off and bought all kinds of fireproof, fire resistant files. No, so you really have to think about the impossible because it, it can happen. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, one of the last questions you know, related to company culture and how your new hires are going to affect the culture of the company. Now, you have people maybe do a 30 minute interview. In that time, it's not a lot of time to determine the personality. Yeah. And determine the skill set. Yeah. So what advice would you give when you are interviewing someone to gauge if this person's personality is right? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. And it's something we, we, we struggle with. What, the way we do it is, first off, we have, we tend to use our staff as the frontline recruiters. So we look at the staff who we think are the culture carriers, the people who have the attributes we kind of like, and say, listen, you go and meet the people and tell us if you think they fit the mold. And they, that they can reduce the number to a certain point before we step in and interview them. We have two kind of get-out clauses. The first one is we tend to hire to national service. And so we have a whole year of kind of test driving, right? At the end of the year, we know that we would have kind of pushed your buttons enough to know the kind of person you are. And so at the end of the year, if you're not really the type of person, say thank you very much, God be with you. Um, if you are, then you come on full time. We also have the obvious one, which is probation. The person comes in and for six months, you can really kind of get a good look at them and kind of throw them in the deep end and see how, you know, how they present themselves, whether they have the values you, you like. And we have a mid-probation review. So we get around the table with the team leaders and say, this person, what do you think? Really? Get good, honest advice. And month six, you can make a decision whether to keep or, or to bin. So you, you, you do have that option at the end of probation to say, thank you very much, but we don't think we made the right choice here. And sometimes they say that to us. At the end of six months, they say, sorry, this company is too, <laughs> this company is too crazy. <laughs> Yeah, so you, you, but it's, it's very important to, 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 to have that kind of window to make sure you're both um, fitted for each other. Yeah. Do you think it would to be helpful to have an onboarding process? Because, I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, yeah. When I went to City Bank, um, you know, a big bank like City Bank, my team didn't have an onboarding process. And we had people in Singapore, you know, Korea. Germany, all these places, and when they were recruited, they didn't know what to do. So I had to create one for a boss to endorse it, and then everybody gets trained in that so that any new recruit will follow the onboarding process. Because at the point, it took people three weeks for them to even get their emails and their computer set up and everything. You're paying them, especially those consultants from India or the engineers. Yeah. Um, so if you're paying somebody for three weeks and the person is not doing anything. Which, which is the bank office was this? Um, I was at Dallow, the Dallow yeah. office um, in Philadelphia. Yeah. So, and we were in charge, in charge of all the authentication, all the authentication services, basically the PKI infrastructure on the school systems. So I realized that it, it actually did help when you know, we had a onboard process because you know, when there's a new recruit, we take them through the onboarding process. And within a week or two, when they are done with the onboarding process, they have everything they need. And part of the onboarding process is also the preparation that we make before the person even starts working. So the account has been created, computers already on the table, you know, all the other things that need to be done. So yeah. I think the onboarding process will be very helpful. Yeah, I mean, that we have. Um, that part is kind of the easy part. And yes, um, 
I think it makes the new employee feel welcome. The fact that by the time they arrive day one, it's like you're expecting them. So their email account has been created, they know where they're going to say it, and they kind of go through an orientation. Uh, it makes me feel better to hear what you just said because I joined City Group in London, same experience. At least now I know it wasn't personal. Um, <laughs> um, yes, but it, it, that part, but that's a, that's a challenge. If it's just like a four man company, you've got yourself busy at the back doing your accounts and talking to your banker, you have a front receptionist and a couple of salespeople running around. Who does that onboarding thing you're talking about? And who even creates a nice little presentation for the new person to say, and that's the bathroom, and that's the kitchen. And you're also sitting there thinking, well, why even do it? Because this person might leave within two weeks, and I have to bring someone else in and do it all over again. So that's the resources bit I was talking about, that a small company might not do it. And if you don't, you need to find time, I guess yeah. is the point. Yeah, no, but it's, it's necessary, because if you don't do that, you can't blame the person for not doing what you expect them to do. I really want to thank you for the presentation. Now, in terms of culture, in the next 10 years, how would you like to see that? Um, we are currently going through a whole series of transformations. Now, I would like to, um, I'd like to think of the culture as um, uh, one way to sum up our culture would be professionalism. That's, that's something which, I know I make light of it, but it's something we take very seriously. Um, in, we, so we, do, we, we like to think we are professional in a very kind of humanly friendly kind of way. So it's not like they come to see your lawyer. Um, we don't always get it right. We've made some really hideous mistakes. But we, we still like to think well, I'd like to think that in 10 years' time, we've been able to institutionalize that. So we have people whose job it is to measure our professionalism and say, listen, if you didn't do this properly, let's apologize, let's pay compensation, or whatever. So everybody knows that these guys get it right, or they kind of come back and say sorry in a nice way. Um, there are other things which will be kind of taking place underneath, but when I think of a young person coming out of school thinking of a place to work, I would like to I would hope that when they think of us, they think of, let me go to this place because it's a good professional place. And if I have that name on my CV, it's easy to find a large job because everybody knows I kind of come through a certain system. And there are some companies like that in the world and you kind of get their name on your CV and their job hunt becomes a lot easier. So that's the kind of reputation I'd, I'd like us to have. Any other questions? Will you advise us to the specific um, industry as far as Dress code is concerned because I know that um, you know not everybody here, including myself, um, will continue to be in the banking uh, industry or maybe is planning to uh, work on that air conditioning or something like that. So, yeah. um, for example, you give us example of the, the computer guys, you know, dress as they want and. And I think um, it's will you advise us to be specific in the industry that we are in so that we can be comfortable and you know do our work. Uh, you mean so we don't have a dress to do work. Oh yes, I think definitely your dress code should be consistent with the industry. No, that's definitely I mean it's all about reassuring the customer. So if I went to my mechanic and the guy came out with a suit and a shirt and cufflinks and a tie, I would be a bit worried. I'm like, okay, is this guy going to fix the car or am I going to fix the car? You know, so, but by the same token, I mean, you sometimes go to the hospital and you're looking at some of the doctors and you're thinking, mm, I wish this guy had just worn a nice white shirt and a red, you know, look, I, well, it's something reassuring, you know, you go see your pasta and you expect, whether we like it or not, we all walk around with stereotypes, right? So, you go see your past time, you expect to see a certain image. Right? The guy comes out in boxer shorts <laughs> and earring, and you're not kind of sure. You're thinking, okay, I know this is 2014, but. <laughs> you know, sorry? Jericho. Jericho, yeah, I think I'm thinking, you know, I wish this guy. Just, yeah, 
you know, I, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying immediately you're, you're sending signals, and it will take a long time for the person to say, "Oh yeah, he wears an earring, but he's still you know, he's cool like that." You know? So yeah, I think it's all about being consistent. And so, um, as I said, we 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 really spent we really agonized over dressing. And I mean, we spent a lot of time thinking about it. It sounds trivial, but for the reasons I was given earlier, that a lot of the feedback, and we, we do solicit feedback, and everybody came back and said, they say you guys are um, elitist, and you guys are snobbish. And so we said, okay. And a lot of it isn't really true, because most people haven't even been to the office. It's what they've heard people talking about. So we said, okay, we need to create an image which is less threatening. And for some reason, people think if you take off your tie, you're less threatening. I, I don't see it like that, but so we have this kind of no tie. But then we realized people were coming to share, to, to work in brown shirts, and it was all getting crazy. So we had to kind of come back with a color code to say, you've got to wear this, and you know, but just keep it professional. And, but definitely, people come to you expecting to see, a, they have a mental image, the way you look, the way you speak, the way you are dressed. And so, yeah, so the advice is whatever industry, you need to be consistent. Um, if you, I mean, when I go to my barber shop and I look around and if I see like a beautician and I'm looking at her nails and her hair and they're not really in tip top shape, I'm like, okay, so you are going to do other people's hair and I'm looking at your hair and you know, if you can do hair, why don't you kind of fix your own hair? You know? So it, it, it creates a certain, it might be totally false, but that's how human beings are wired. Yeah, sorry. So it's probably easier to, um, yeah. No, I'll finish it then. Easier to maybe fire an employee yes. than uh, maybe a new hire who probably you felt was not carrying the culture. Um, how how do you, would you handle that if the situation was with a co founder who could possibly has as much equity in the business as you <laughs> <laughs> um, But that, that's, that, that's a fair point. I mean, that's how do you disengage with a business partner who you realize you don't have the same values? Never mind culture, but just values. You know, you, you met this guy. I mean, we we've been very very fortunate. You know, we you, you, we've, it feels as if we've known each other all our lives, but we haven't. But sometimes you get together with people and you realize you're on totally different frequencies. And by which time you would have started the business, you sign a shareholders agreement. It's always a good advice. And so you're joined with this guy. How do you disengage? You know, it's very difficult. It's, and that is why, again, maybe you might have this as another session with you know, get some lawyers in. The, the, the essence of a shareholder's agreement. I don't know if anybody has gone through that process before. Oh, it's a joy. I mean, you, because you really have to think through different states of the world. Um, I spoke earlier about the kind of shareholders we started. It took us. And I'm not as hydrating. We were on ours for about a year and a half. And it went, because we had our lawyers, the IFC guys had their lawyers, the standard banker, and it went back and forth, back and forth. And everybody's going through line by line because it's that when you need that document, you know you're in trouble. Because that's when you're going to say, okay, what does it say about parting ways? Who gets what? How does the company get valued? Who gets. So it's, I mean, it's a very important. It's all like a prenup, right? You need to think about it. You need to think about it because you might need it. You might join up with someone, you set up this wonderful business, and then you realize either they have a drug problem or they're stealing from the company or they're doing things you just have a problem with. And you have a choice. You can either stick around and develop hard problems so, or say, listen, let's sell this business. I'll take the offshore piece. You can take the Ghana piece. That's what we said in the shareholders agreement. But if you, don't, if you haven't signed one of those things, uh, you might have a problem. So definitely, I mean, I, I think it's, if you're going to do a partnership, spend some money, get a lawyer, and with all respect to any lawyer in this room, get a lawyer who knows what they're talking about, and what they're about, and get them to really craft something very solid for you. I mean, last time we did this, we actually went to the UK to get a law firm to do it for us. That's how seriously we take it now. Um, because it is a very, very critical document. Because for the reason you just put it, that it's easy to find employee, but when you're kind of divorcing your business partner, it's, it's, it's so uh, in addition to the shareholders agreement, you also have bylaws for them. No, the bylaws will not. Are the shareholders not 
I mean, the board of directors, are they not required to, or the shareholders, are they not required to? Are they not required? Well, what I'm talking there's a company code and all of that stuff. And then there's an agreement which you as shareholders in the business sign to say that this is what we do. Uh, nobody shall borrow from the business. Nobody shall do X, Y, Z. If you ever get involved in I know, some drug case, um, we can't have you as part of the business. We'll value the business and give you <coughs> If a member dies, um, their, their wife can't come and join the company automatically. Stuff like that, because that's what tends to happen. People could say, this my husband was there, I'm there now. So it has to be very clear in what it says. And unless you have somebody who's been able to think through all these things, you, you run into all kinds of difficulties. The good news is there are templates out there. I'm sure if you go on the net, you probably find some very good ones. But you must have something which kind of envisages what could possibly happen in the future. So I think there's one hand at the back of the yeah. Yes, please. So uh, the question is this. Uh, you mentioned that people normally have stereotypes. So in dressing, for example, customers expect that you are a certain way. Uh, what if a situation arises where you find out that um, the best or the most suitable uh, dress code, for example, it will be something else that um, makes you more efficient and more productive at your work is different from what your customer expects. How can you be able to say re-educate the customer that even though you expect me to appear this way, uh, I might probably be appearing this other way? Yeah. No. no, I think that's also a very relevant point. So, um, so I, I used to work in investment banking, and um, <laughs> these guys, you know, dressing is very important, hugely important. And so, everybody had to have like white starch shirts, and your ties had to be, you couldn't go buy shirt ties from some street corner. You buy ties, you have to go to. There's certain brands everybody expected. And people actually used to come and tell your tie and look at the brand. Oh my God. And I'm not exaggerating. There are people like that. Oh, that's nice. Though. Where is it from? <laughs> and if it's not, <laughs> if it's not Hermes or Salvatore for a gun or something, I guess it's what's this you're wearing. <laughs> and then there was this whole dot com revolution. This is, I'm talking um, 98, 99, early 2000. And then Something also very bizarre happened. As the, the whole industry really started heating up. They, they just couldn't find enough people to hire, which is, if you know how the industry works, it's yeah. quite bizarre. They just couldn't find enough people. So they, came up with, and so they came up with this bizarre thing where they interviewed staff and said, what should we do to make you happier? And so people said, oh yeah, okay, can we get rid of all these ties and kind of look cool like all those dot-com people in Silicon Valley? So in an industry where typically people have you, know, you wear suits to come to work and sometimes even at your desk you've got a suit on and you have people who come to work with one suit and they have another suit hanging in their cubicle and I'm not exaggerating. All of a sudden people are working, working around with open shirts and going to client visits without it. That, that was, as you're saying, quite revolutionary because when those guys go into a building, they're not going to see a customer service people. They're going to see the CEO, CFO. They don't go talk. So, you're always meeting very important people. So if your customer is wearing a suit and a tie and he takes his business very seriously and you turn up like you're going to a party, you better have a very good story for them. So the, way, the answer to your question is, if you're going to do that, make sure you don't kind of screw up on the work side. You know, you know what I'm saying? It compensates for the fact that they have this misconception. It's almost like you're having an interview, everybody's dressed a certain way, then some kid walks in, they're not wearing a tie. When I'm doing the interview, that's when I put my pen down. I'm like, okay, this had better be. <laughs> <laughs> and so sometimes they open their mouth and you think, actually, I don't mind the fact that this guy is not wearing a tie, they're good. But if they open their mouth and then you know, their speech is consistent with their dressing, then you think, okay, no wonder you didn't wear a tie. So, you know, so it's, it's that thing where you don't want to create a headache for yourself, especially if you are pitching for business. If sometimes your clients need you more than you need them, there are businesses like that. You can wear pajamas if you want. Yeah. But where you, you know, you're going for a client meeting, you're going to pitch to a client, you want their business, you've got competition there. It's a beauty parade. Everybody comes in, they bring in all their sales girls, their nine inch heels, and you turn up 
and you don't look at heart, you have better be sure you've got some something to compensate for the fact that you turn up like that. That's all I'm saying. Otherwise, you know, stereotypes are stereotypes, you know, yeah, and necessary human evil. But it's just that in business, you don't want to handicap yourself. That, that's that's the only point I'm making. I know, does that? Uh, well, the person was doing, uh, was more like it, it became necessary. For example, you think that changing that will make your staff more productive, actually. Yeah. So we have a challenge now to get your staff more productive. You yeah. have this challenge of, say, re educating your customers. That, look, even though you expect to see us this way, it's better than we appear this way because it makes us more productive. And that's what I'm saying that your customers will understand that if indeed you are more productive. Mm -hmm. But if you are not, then they'll say, so then they tend to think you are this way because you don't even care about their business. Mm -hmm. You know how you turn up at a client's site shows how much you care about their business? Sure. You know, when you turn up with your laptops and your suits, everybody thinks you take their business seriously. Everybody, all your people at the meeting have got notepads, they've got their iPads, they're taking notes, they've got business cards. Yeah. The client feels, okay, these people are ready. People who show up for meetings, they don't have business cards, they don't take notes. The client is sitting there thinking, I don't know about these people, they're not very serious. So that, it's along those lines I'm making that comment. So when you turn up, I'm the client, I'm, I care about my business, my image, I'm wearing my very expensive suit and tie. You come dressed not so professionally. Immediately, you, you're handicapped, especially if you came after a competitor who came in a certain way. And was well prepared. So you just want to make sure that you overcompensate for that. At some point, the client will realize actually it doesn't matter, and the industry will move on. And that's the point I was making earlier that it got to a time where the clients realized the investment bankers or whoever they were didn't have to wear tie to make the point. They still got the job done. That, that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was okay. It's been very insightful. We've learned a lot about how to build a company culture. I think it's a vital thing. It, 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 it's nothing at all when you're getting your team together to build that big business that you want to become one day. If you don't get it right from the start, I think we've learned from what you said in the early days of Ghana Home Loans and the way you're do, what you're doing now is pure evidence that this is something we all have to take very seriously. Um, we've come to the end of the evening. I just have a few things, that, a few announcements I want to make. The first one is that those who want to pitch for the Accelerator Program 2015, um, right after the program it's starting. So if you see um, Nana or Jennifer will be outside with Sam, they will usher you in to the pitch room so you can uh, make your pitch. Second thing is please don't leave. We have some refreshments. Hang around. The exhibition is still going on. So network with each other, get to know each other and the businesses that you're doing. And Pick I'm sure things. could you spend a few more minutes with us? Yes, please take a gun of hope and look and yeah. spend a few more minutes if you want to talk to him about loans or anything you want to company culture. The third thing I want to say is a very big thank you to the people who supported us this evening. And that's um, Capture who supported us with photography for the evening. And um, also Sedlet Africa who have supported us with the venue that we have and the continuous support they give us from, the, from having been our parents and slowly letting us into the, <laughs> into the world, if I can call it that. Thank you very much for the support that you continue to give us. And the last thing I want to say is uh, please fill the forms that you were given when you came in. We do need your feedback. And this is how we also build our culture. And so please let us know what went right and what went wrong. This is the first for us. We're changing, as I said. So we'd like to know what, the, what we're doing right and what we're not doing so well. Finally, as always, I have to, I have to mention this. If, as small businesses, we will not all have the resources and the tools to be able to do the things that we need to do to fulfill, uh, make our, take our businesses to the next level. And for that reason, we, we, I always recommend that you speak to the center guys on the business course that they have going and also on the management services that they have going because these are the tools that will support the small business to be able to go out there, do what you do best, which is your passion for your business, sell your business while they take care of all the bits at the back that we're almost always not equipped to do on our own. So thank you very much. We've come to the end of um, Demo Friday and Send the Friday. Thank you very much to my exhibitors. Thank you very much to those of you who came to participate. Please let's put our heads in prayer and say thank you. Yes, you do. 
Our Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for our facilitator tonight. We thank you for the exhibitors. We thank you for bringing us to the end of today's program. Father, we pray that as we leave this place, whatever we've learned here wouldn't just end here, but it will be part of us and then we will go and then work with it. We pray also we commit the various businesses here into your hands. We pray that grant them grace and the ability to build their business as well. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Please let's all take a photograph so we have memories for this. And also leave your business card when you're leaving.